the eternal one is still on the throne. <laughs> so saints, lift up holy hands. Lift high your voices and praise the sovereign one. For mighty is our God. Holy are his judgments. And he's altogether lovely. Let us praise him. Praise him. Praise him. We're going to follow our program as, as printed. If you would stand and for the evening, we will move to the catechism reading in the back of the bulletin. Let Brother Ralph come on in. <clears throat> First question, how and why did God create us? God created us male and female in his own image to know him, to love him, to live with him, and glorify him. And it is right that we should live in his glory. Amen. What else did God create? How can we glorify God? We glorify God by enjoying Him, loving Him, serving Him, and by praising His will, commanding Him all. Amen. Amen. We're blessed to have with us Brother Ernest Wiltshire. He's our intern that's going to be with us till May 15th. May 15th. Amen. Amen. He's going to be with we'll us be and on. experience and serve with us. and part of his Masters of Divinity program, and he's going to lead us in prayer this evening. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Elder Cornelius. Let's bow our heads Amen. as we lift up our hearts to a holy God. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, yeah. hallowed be thy name. Again, I say hallowed be thy name. For thou art worthy of our praise. You are worthy of all honor. You're worthy of all glory. For you hold our very lives and the next breath we take in your hand. God, lead us and guide us as you would have us to walk and have us to do your will, Father. Lord, tonight we ask God that, Father, if there is one or more here tonight who has not responded to a call that you've placed on their heart, that this may be the time, Father, that they would step forward and receive that glorious, glorious blessing you have in store for them. Lord, we also ask tonight as, as Brother Pastor Vic comes and breaks the bread of life, Father, that our minds and our hearts would be stayed on you. That, Lord God, that we would receive that tonight that you wish for us to have. That we might apply it to our lives, not just in this building, but out there where it really counts. In a lost and a dying world. So, Lord, we ask, Father, tonight, God, that you would lift Brother Vic up tonight, Pastor Vic. Strengthen him, Lord, by your might. Give him that which he stands in need of tonight, that he would bring honor and glory to that precious name of Jesus. And Lord, tonight, Father, we just offer up to you our worship and our praise, and we pray, Father, that it is acceptable in thy sight. For, Lord, we wish to honor you for all that you have done for us, the past mercies, the past graces, may they well up in our heart here tonight. And may it bring forth that worship, Father, that results in the praise of our lips. And Father, we just praise you now and thank you for your holy love, 
for that grace that you showed toward us, Father, that you've called us out of place of darkness into your marvelous light. Lord, that you reached down to a place, Father, where we couldn't reach up. And you grabbed us up, Father, to be your very own children. And for that tonight, God, we just praise you. We thank you, Lord. We ask, God, that you'd bless each and every household present here tonight. We ask, Father, that you would go before them during the week, Father, and just give them, give them room where they may rejoice in your love, Father that the world out there might see that and inquire of them their joy. Father, these things we ask in the blessed and precious holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the people of God said, Amen. 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 Let those out in. Would you turn in your hymnals, hymn number 501. Standing in need of prayer. 501. Standing in the need of prayer. that time in our service once again where we worship by giving we ask our deacons to come and set our tables might have opportunity this evening to bring their offering if you did not have an opportunity this morning to bring your tithe you may do so now followed by the evening offering we're honored to have our guest usher this evening amen All titles, please come if there be one.
Let us bow. Father God, we bow before you once again. Thank you, Master, for all things. We thank you, Lord, for this day, another day you've given to us, how you've blessed us with new mercies. We thank you, Lord, for how you give us all that we have, all the substance that we have. And now, Lord, we pray that a portion of that has been given back. We ask you, Lord, to bless it. Bless it that it may be used for the upbuilding of thy kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. standing and turn in your hymnals to hymn number 486, 486. We're going to sing Sweet. this one a little in parts tonight. Ladies, if you'll take the first verse. And I looked over Jordan, what did I see? Everybody's going to say, come and fight a carry me home. When we get to the second verse, the men are going to sing. Okay. Open your book, 486. 486. Amen. Amen. Uh, 
Good evening, church. Thank you, Brother Marion, for leading us. Sister Joyce leading us in the hymns tonight. You know what book we're headed. Mark chapter 12. Verse 38 to verse 40. Gospel of Mark chapter 12. Verse 30 to verse 40. Can I get an amen when you made it? The word of God reads thus. In his teaching, he was saying, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. That's our text for tonight. Let us pray. Well, Father, we come. We understand, O oh God, that there are portions of your word that are exhortative, Lord. They exhort us. They encourage us. There are other aspects of your word that are warnings and admonitions, O oh God, that call for us to have our spiritual antennas up. How important it is in this day and age to have discernment. To be able to know the difference between what is true and what is false. Yeah. To know what is right when it comes to the things of God and what is wrong. Well, Father, I pray that we as a church would be like the Bereans, who are more noble-minded than the Thessalonians, who search the scripture daily to make sure that even what the apostle Paul preached yeah. was so. Guide us tonight through your word we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. I'd like to entitle the message tonight, Beware of Hypocritical Preachers. Beware of Hypocritical Preachers. Mr. Seton Thompson spent years watching the lives of wild animals. He declares that the instinct to recognize danger that some of them have is so extraordinary that it really seems as if there must be an angel who warns and protects them. Defended by this instinct only, they will not touch poisonous grasses. They unerringly avoid the presence of their foes. But people are not like that. They open their doors and their hearts to false prophets who hide the hook of falsehood with the bait of truth. There's hardly a person in the world so mean as to lie to another about the right road to the next town. But how many folks mislead others about the right way to heaven, end of quote. There is indeed nothing as dangerous as religious leaders who claim to represent God and yet lie on God in order to mislead others. And there's nothing as foolish as religious followers who don't think this is possible. The key to avoiding being misled in a world of deception is that all of us must grow and biblical discernment. We must know the truth so well that we can spot a lie. In our text this evening, Jesus gives us a biographical sketch of the type of false preachers we need to avoid. You notice in your bulletin there's an outline for this text. It records three descriptions of the type of hypocritical preachers the Lord warns us about. The first description is given to us in Matthew chapter 23 verses 1 through 3. Uh, this description basically says they love preaching the word to others but not living it out themselves. As you're in Mark chapter 12 verse 38 notice it says in, the, in his teaching referring to our Lord Jesus he was saying beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces. In his teaching he was saying now Give you a little bit of context from Mark chapter 11, verse 27, all the way to chapter 12, verse 44, pretty much the end of this chapter. Our Lord has been in the temple courts conversing and interacting with the religious leaders and the multitude on Wednesday of the Passion Week. And now we come to this final discourse of our Lord, this final 
interaction that our Lord will have with the religious leaders and the crowd. Uh, this final discourse is a public denunciation of the scribes and Pharisees' hypocritical character as teachers of God's law. Therefore, in his teaching, Jesus will expose the false religiosity of Israel's spiritual leaders. This public denunciation is nothing new in Israel's history. From the time of the Old Testament prophets to the New Testament apostles, God has warned his people concerning the dangers of false teachers. They have been described as blind men who know nothing, mute dogs unable to bark, dreamers lying down who love to slumber, demented fools, reckless, treacherous men, ravenous wolves, blind guides of the blind, hypocrites, fools, whitewashed tombs full of bones, serpents, brood of vipers, thieves and robbers, savage wolves, slaves of their own appetites, hucksters peddling the word of God, false apostles, deceitful workers, slaves of their own appetites, servants of Satan, purveyors of a different gospel, dogs, evil workers, enemies of the cross, those who are conceited and understand nothing, men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth, Many who have gone astray from the truth, captives of the devil, deceivers, ungodly persons, and unreasoning animals. Why must we heed the warning to beware of hypocritical preachers? Because it's much easier to run into an unqualified man than a qualified man in the ministry. There are many more hypocritical preachers than there are of godly ones. We live in a time similar to David when he looked around the nation and saw more liars than the righteous. And in Psalm chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, you can hear uh, David's prayer, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear among the sons of men. They speak falsehood to one another with flattering lips and with a double heart, they speak. And, and, and church, our ability to identify true preachers from the false one has to go beyond merely subjective feelings and faulty measurements. Right. We, we can't look to ourselves. We, we can't be our own source of authority. We can't look within ourselves and, and assume that we can uh, know the truth and identify what's right and what's wrong must go beyond the subjective and faulty measurements of feeling, personal opinion, and pragmatic results. Uh, we must hold to the biblical standard, church, uh, of the type of character the Holy Spirit produces within the man whom he calls into the ministry. Uh, we cannot be afford, to be, to, to afford to be led by feelings that say, I always feel uplifted when he preaches. Or personal opinion, I, I believe. Uh, he or she is anointed by God. Or we can't even look at pragmatic results and say, look at the number of people who attend that church. Surely God's blessing is upon that ministry. When it comes to feelings, we must remember, as it says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? When it comes to personal opinion, we must remember the words of Proverbs, do not be wise. In your own eyes, fear God and turn away from evil. When it comes to measuring the blessings of God upon a particular ministry, we must realize that numbers cannot be the basis or the standard or the measurement of God's blessings. The Lord said it himself in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those. Who enter into it. Then you go over to verse 23 and our Lord says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles in your name? Church, our Lord gives a prophetic warning in Matthew 7. Reminds us that many religious people will be following many false preachers on the day of judgment. These false preachers will be shocked that they're at the great white throne judgment and they'll begin to pronounce the ministries they did for Jesus. And he will say these haunting words, 
I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The last thing you want to do is follow a hypocritical preacher on his way to hell. This is why we must heed the warning of this section. And the first warning concerning hypocritical preachers is they love preaching the word to others, but not living it out themselves. Matthew 23, 1 through 3, Matthew records the same account that we find here in Mark, except with more detail. And in Matthew 23, 1 through 4, our Lord spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all they tell you do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. Hypocritical preachers love to command others to heed the word while they themselves refuse to live it out. This is what makes a hypocritical preacher a hypocritical preacher. They know the word. They can rightly divide the word. They can expound the word, but they don't live the word. Now keep in mind, the, the scribes and Pharisees of that time were the most conservative religious group in Israel. They held to the whole Old Testament as the word of God, unlike the Sadducees. They held to the word of God. They believed uh, in the miracles of resurrection. They believed in the reality of angels. They believed in, in the truth of, of, of a future judgment, unlike the Sadducees. You can say that the Pharisees and the scribes were fundamentalists when it came to their doctrine. And they were conservative in their morals. But they were religious hypocrites in their behavior. Therefore, what they said concerning the word was true, as our Lord is saying, but it's only important for the multitudes to heed it while they themselves say things and do not do them. It was Merrill Tenney that said, you cannot separate truth from the one who preaches it to you. It was Gregory the Great that said, he who is required by the necessity of his position to speak the highest things is compelled by the same necessity to exemplify the highest things. In other words, we are to preach and live what we preach. There are plenty of bad reasoning happening among Christians in our country saying that it's possible to separate truth from the one who preaches it to you. That a pastor can fall morally or you can have shady politicians who profess to know Christ and yet people in the church will defend them for saying one thing and living another. That all that matters is a person's theological position or someone's stance on moral issues, but how they live is between them and God. Jesus never drew such a false dichotomy to minimize behavior while highlighting the truth they proclaim is to indoctrinate others to live the same way. Y'all hear me tonight? Our Lord says in Matthew 23, verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel about on sea and land and make one proselyte. You make one follower of Judaism. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much as the son of hell as you. These are some strong words by our Lord. Truth is not simply to be affirmed. It is to be believed and obeyed. Or else we're lying on God. Thus, we who are true preachers of the gospel are warned by the words of Richard Baxter in his book, Reformed Pastor, who said, quote, don't unsay with your life what you say with your tongue. So we come to this first, first description of a hypocritical preacher. They love to preach the word to others, but refuse to live it out themselves. The second description is given to us in our text tonight in verse 38 to verse 39. The second description of the type of hypocritical preacher the Lord warns us about is they love the position of authority in order to be revered by many. Verse 38, in his teaching, he was saying, beware of the scribes who love to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces. He was saying, beware of the scribes. Beware is a present tense command. Always be on the guard. Always take heed. Always be watchful. Be careful. Be discerning. 
Always turn your thoughts and direct your minds away from. Look away from the scribes. That means don't allow your heart to be fond or, or admire the shady character of hypocritical preachers. It's not a joke. You may listen to them preach, but you got to be careful not to be influenced by their behavior. And then our Lord gives six descriptions of their hypocritical behavior. Number one, they are the ones who love to dress the part, but not live the part, who like to walk around in long robes. Long robes, the cultural background there, they love to walk around in long white linen garments with, with, with fringes, that, fringes that were worn by the priest. Scribes, in other words, they love status. They love dressing like priests in order to be viewed as having a high standing in the community. They also, number two, like the respectful greetings at the marketplaces. They like the oral salutations. They like to go where the crowds are in the marketplaces at high noon where everybody will be around. And they love to hear them be greeted, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, verse 7. They love to be called rabbi, teacher of the law. They love to be called father, spiritual nurturer of those who are committed to the law. They love to be called leader as those who are the spiritual guides to those in the law. They love to hear this. In fact, uh, it was even said that so weighty was the duty of respectful salutation by the title rabbi that to neglect to give oral salutation to them in public carried a weighty punishment. Jesus spoke against the disciples allowing themselves to be called rabbi, teacher. Don't let nobody call you rabbi. Don't let anybody call you father. No, don't let anybody call you leader. You only have one leader, and that's me. You only have one father, and that's the one in heaven. And you only have one rabbi, and that is me. Now, now, now the point here, church, is that it's not wrong to address someone as pastor or leader or deacon or teacher. But the point is, don't have a blind allegiance to them. To the point that reverend and elder and bishop and apostle or prophet takes on a connotation of supreme leader. I don't know if you heard it. There have been those who are in churches where where they realize that their leader has so much control over their thinking and their behavior. They can't make uh, just basic decisions about life without talking to their bishop. They got to be told what to dress, what color to put on and what to watch and what not to watch at home, what to play and not play when it comes to their recreation. And this is the sort of of, of overbearing uh, authority that Jesus speaks of. Jesus alone is our superior leader. Jesus alone is our savior. God alone is our father. Therefore, we should not refer to even the pope as a father. We should not refer to a bishop as the anointed one. Jesus is the only anointed one. Any assembly that calls itself a church, but the congregation's obedience is measured by the rules of the leadership as opposed to what the Bible says is not a church, but a cult. Any assembly that becomes afraid to voice their concerns to the leadership is not a true church, but a personality cult. Any assembly that finds itself under the domineering spirit of a leader who controls what they wear, what they give, and how they ought to think is a false, false church. I've heard of churches where the pastor dictates your budget and how much money you give. They require for you to give them a bank statement. I'm not lying. The Lord says, beware of those who who try to become the spiritual authority in your life and thus replace Jesus, who's the head of the church. Jesus told his disciples that the greatest among you is your servant. In fact, it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2a to verse 3, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, not for sort of gain, but with eagerness, yeah. not lording over those allotted 
to your charge, but proven to be examples to the flock. Bible's clear. You're not to lord over those allotted to your charge, but be examples to the flock. Beware of hypocritical preachers. Verse 39, they also love the chief seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at the banquet. Uh, the chief seats in the synagogue, this is reserved for the dignitary. In fact, uh, the synagogue would be faced like this. You would have uh, the Pharisees and the scribes sit like this and out and, and facing you all, and they would have the, the ark, and they would have this ark or this box that would contain the sacred scriptures. And they love to come in into the synagogue and take the seats, as you would say, on the pulpit so they can look out at you and you can admire them. Come on. They love to sit in positions of authority for their own imagined self-importance. Mm, I just want to make a point that sitting in the pulpit yeah. don't make you superior to anybody else. Amen. We're still sinners saved by grace. Yes. Wearing a robe doesn't make me more set apart from God than you. I'm, I'm still a sinner saved by grace. Don't ever assume that the office of the pastor makes the person who occupies that office holier than thou. Come on. The office of the pastor is a sacred office to which only a few are qualified. It's a holy calling, but the person who occupies the position is not divine. He's not an angel, but a sinner saved by grace. They love to sit in the chief seats, in the first seats in the synagogue. Not only that, they love to sit in verse 39, places of honor at the banquet. This was the special evening meals. And when someone of prominence would invite them over, they would always want to get the seat closest to the host and thus receive preferential treatment. Warren Wisby and his son wrote a book years ago, Making Sense of Ministry, gave 10 Basic statements about ministry. It's important for you to understand what ministry is all about. Number one, the foundation of ministry is character. Two, the nature of ministry is service. Three, the motive of ministry is love. Four, the measure of ministry is sacrifice. Five, the authority of ministry is submission. Six, the purpose of ministry is the glory of God. Seven, the tools of ministry is the word of God. And prayer. Eight, the privilege of ministry is growth. Nine, the power of ministry is the Holy Spirit. And ten, the model for ministry is Jesus Christ. Amen. It's all about Christ. Yes. Not about the man. It's all about Christ. Christ mediates his rule through the word, not through a man. Mm -hmm. Not everything that comes out of the mouth of the preacher is divine. Only when he quotes and expounds scripture. Are y'all hearing me tonight? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There was a poem written years ago. There's a pastor, himself he cherished, who loved his position, not his parish. So the more he preached, the less he reached, and this is why his parish perished. The third description of the type of hypocritical preachers our Lord warns us about. It was given lastly here in verse 40. They love the pretense of spirituality in order to swindle people out of their money. Verse 40. Who devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. They devour. They consume. They forcefully appropriate. The tense there is continual. They, they look out for the socially powerless person, the unsuspecting person. In this context, it would refer to the widow's houses. Now, in the first century, the teachers of the law were not allowed to be paid for their services. So instead of trusting the Lord or getting a side job, they decided to take advantage of those who had very little means who had little social weight. There are many ways in which they may have devoured or consumed the finances of widows. They may have asked widows to contribute more than they can reasonably be expected to do. 
They may have offered to help widows settle estates that fell to them, meanwhile taking for themselves more than was coming to them. They may have taken unfair advantage of material support, which initially had been volunteered by the widows. Whatever the method that was used, Jesus here clearly is condemning the crime of extortion. This is one of the most heinous sins that can be committed because in the, in the history of Israel, the widows and the orphans were the, were the ones that were so easily to be overlooked and take advantage of. They were the ones that needed justice and protection. And all the while, while they're doing this, stealing the money of widows, all they have to live on, then they'll stand up and appear to make long prayers. This is religious hypocrisy for appearance sake, for pretext, for m false motives. They'll stand up and make long prayers. In fact, it says in Matthew chapter 6, they like to stand in the marketplace where everybody is and, and make long prayers to make it look as if they're being so spiritual. The tense here of long prayers could be that they, 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 they would almost feel like in their spirit, oh, it's time for me to pray. As if God was drawing them in that moment to pray. But Jesus says, it's all pretense. It's all fake. It's not real. Don't, don't be led astray. And then he says here at the end, these will receive greater condemnation. The ministry of proclaiming the word is not something you enter into lightly. James chapter 3 verse 1 says, let not many of you become teachers, my brother, knowing you will receive a stricter judgment. As one preacher said, all judgment is strict. But for the preacher, it's a stricter judgment. It's sobering. That means that the degree of judgment is much heavier for preachers than any other occupation in the world. And why not? Because there's nothing at all, there's nothing in all the world so evil as a preacher pretending to be sincere in his service to God well, in order to trick the unsuspecting and giving them money. Mm. Years ago, in the PTL scandal with Jim Baker, uh, there was uh, a number of other false teachers, Peter Popoff, one man down in Dallas who would get on television and tell people to sow a seed of finances. Give, give $1,000 and God will bless you. And they had news cameras behind this particular headquarters filming as the people would get the money, take the money out and throw the letter in the trash. You have these, these hucksters. And they'll tell you what you want to hear. They'll preach your best life now. They'll tell you about being loose. To get out of you money to finance their ministry. One down in Atlanta asked his congregation, I, I, need, I need this amount of money. I need $25 million so I can get me a jet. Because a preacher don't need to be going and flying commercial. And it may be funny to us, but people do this. And, and Jesus is saying they will receive a greater, a greater condemnation. They are indeed the most dangerous. But as we come to the close of this passage tonight, as we heed the warning of our Lord concerning hypocritical preachers, uh, we must maintain the balance here. The warning is not meant to teach that it's possible for a true believer to lose his salvation. This warning is simply meant to teach us not to be led astray from the truth so that we don't lose our reward of service to God. At the end of the day, no matter how deceptive a hypocritical preacher is, those of us who are saved can rest assured that we're kept by God. As Jude completes or concludes his letter, he says in verse 24 and 23, Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, yeah. dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. 
Amen. In other words, Jude is saying, now to him who is able, he is able of himself. God has enough power in himself to keep his own. God is not the, he doesn't have to borrow power from you. He doesn't need your strength. He doesn't need anything outside of himself to keep his elect. He doesn't need your assistance in order to keep you. He doesn't need your cooperation in order to keep you. God can keep you all by himself. Now unto him who is able. Present tense continue. He's always able. Our God has so much power. He neither slumbers nor sleep. Our God is able to keep you without interruption, without interference for the rest of your life. Now unto him who is able to keep, guard, and protect you. You know, the same word guard and protect is used in Luke chapter 2 verse 8 when the shepherds said they were watching their flock by night. That God watches over you even at night. That darkness is light to our God. He knows where you are. In fact, that no matter what the devil does, God puts limits on Satan. He cannot touch God's people. Our Lord said it best in John 17, 12. While I was with them, he's saying to the Father, while I was with them, I was keeping them in thy name. Thou hast given me and I guarded them. And not one of them perished, but the son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. The only one that the devil could touch was Judas. Why? Because Judas did not belong to Jesus. That's why when you get in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and, and the religious leaders came to arrest our Lord, he said, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazarene. And he says, I am. And the text says they bowed. And he said, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. If you come to get me, let these go their way. You're not going to touch my disciples. Yeah. And they had to obey the sovereignty of our God. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling, church. God is able to keep you from being tripped up and pushed out of his kingdom. God is able to keep you standing in a world of deception. He's able to keep you standing even in your carnal flesh. He's able to keep you standing when the devil comes around you. God has his own. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me and I give them eternal life and no one snatches them out of my hand. The father who gave, me, gave them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of his hand. Listen, you will stumble, but you always stumble in his hand. You never fall out of it. Yeah. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand, he will make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and beyond reproach to the only wise God through our Lord Jesus Christ, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and forever. Let the church say, amen, 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 amen. All oh, to be kept, to be kept by Jesus. It's so good to know that no matter what happens around us, no matter what the devil tried to do to us, God has his own. Amen. As we stand tonight, there may be someone here don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We don't give an invitation here. There's a call to discipleship. The call to discipleship, Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself. Pick up his cross and follow me. That is salvation in discipleship terms. That means you must repent, turn from your sin, and submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Come. There may be somewhere tonight who is already saved but doesn't have a church home. If you deem that this ministry is a ministry you'd like to be a part of, come and join us.
be kept by Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we gather hands for our closing benediction. Good to see Elder Anthony up there in the balcony. He went up there intentionally because he knew I was going to call him to do the benediction. So he decided he'll go upstairs. Remember our Tuesday noon and evening Bible study this week. Amen. And be in prayer. Be in prayer for our missionary, Andrew, as we talked about this morning in China. Please be in prayer for him and his family. Be in prayer for Sister Rhoda Robinson, Bobby Robinson, the Robinson family. Let's continue to keep each other lifted up. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you for this Lord's day. It's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Oh, Father God, this is the place where we get our minds renewed, where we find ourselves encouraged. Uh, when we are encouraged to see things from an eternal perspective. Everything that's going on out there, the, today's news will be old news in a 24 hours. But the good news is eternal. Oh, Father God, I pray that you would help us to keep our minds stayed on thee. You will keep us in perfect peace. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond all we can ever ask or think according to the power that works within us. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus from generation to generation. Let the church say, Bless you. Love you, Main Street. I told you, man. I told you, Mrs. Home Church. I told you, Mrs. Home Church, man.